There's application. Um, so you know there was there were a lot of people who were excited, and you know so Young Jin was you know the other guy, and we thought, man, you know, this is great. We really have to keep doing this, you know, because ultimately, you know, like the biggest value in terms of making those connections is following up with them and you know sharing space and having projects develop rather than you know meeting once a week. And you know, so far it's really turned out there's a very energetic community. A lot of you know, people from the universities, you know, in town have been representing, whether they're grad students, whether they're young faculty or researchers, uh, and whether they represent you know nonprofits. Oh, uh, Becky Levin, also from Larry Children's Memorial and project director, program director for Sky. Sure, something like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was also a dead guy. Uh, you know, and, you know, it's exciting to see a lot of uh, really other people you know, like so uh, in any case, you know, the, the way we're going to go is uh, Joe and uh, David are going to give a presentation on uh, the new uh, Chicago Tribune uh, uh, application on you know, visualizing climate in the city. It's beautiful if you didn't have to you know, check out the link. Uh, then Jason Alberti is uh, you know, down from Flint, uh, Michigan, and he's been collecting a phenomenal multi-year longitudinal data set on uh, kids in Flint, uh, and it's going to be uh, you know, talking about the data set. And after that, really the majority of the evening is just, you know, come and meet everybody and talk about the kind of stuff you're interested in. Uh, so, uh, actually, for starters, um, you should know everybody who is in the room. So, uh, if you would like to, you know, start it off and just say, you know, what you do and what brought you here and, you know, the types of, you know, folks that you're, you know, interested in, in meeting or collaborating with, uh, you know, take a minute to do it. My name is Jennifer Horch. Um, the company that I'm starting is GenX and Associates. We wrote the uh, grant for developing a regional plan for sustainable development for the Rockford region. And so we're using an open source platform called Weed, which is developed by the Open Indicators Consortium based out of UMass Lowell. But essentially, it allows us to take a ton of different community data and geocode it and start comparing apples to oranges. So the prototype website, you can find at ourvitalsigns.com. OURvitalscience.com, and we're in the process of launching all of our social equity data right now. We have 61 uh, areas of sustainability we're looking at, so I'm very interested to hear what everyone is going to be talking about. We're doing health, safety, economic development, transportation. Um, so, uh, very interested to get your feedback both on the website and my contact information on the website, and also to find out what you're doing. Uh, my name is Adam Kraft. Uh, I run a company called Geo Polster. <clears throat> what we try to do is uh, help consumers make better choices, like are you going to places that give money to Democrats or Republicans? So what we did is we linked the data, we linked the uh, election data from the Center for Responsive Politics with the Foursquare API. So what the app does is you check into a place, the Foursquare will tell you about the campaign contributions. And we just launched last week, it's geopolster.com. Awesome. Well, it was on the site. Oh really? Yeah. I saw you. <laughs> what? Oh, I signed up for the meetup. Okay, cool. Cool. I'm here. I'm talking about the director of our money staff. I work on a reporting division. So basically, the system and data is very important for us to be That's another reason I come here because I see a post from Delhi in the very big meeting. Yeah, I'm not. My name is Dick Panther. I wear two different hats. One is Spectrum Systems, which is a company that works with large volume of data that financial institutions generate. And the other company is a startup called Opinion EQ. We have an engine for sentiment analysis and opinion mining. And in one of the goals is develop new indicators based on that that would go way to an initial community. I'm Kaylin. I am a fund research analyst at Morningstar. Um, I work I work on a lot of tool development for our software products and that sort of leads into the area of data viz. So I'm interested in learning more about that and sort of more um, figuring out where the data sets are to play with to figure out how we need to build Sorry, I'm not sure. I'm just going to make sure that. Oh, and by the way, we are we're recording the meeting, so for people who couldn't make it today. Um, 
So your voices are on that. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, excellent. He's on Zoom. Yeah, I guess. It's the, uh, <laughs> so we better look good. Yeah, yeah, look good. Um, so, um, I am here to learn more about data visualization and sort of where, sort of some, you know, tools on how to do that. Right now, it's sort of very design driven, and it's it's difficult for me with a non I'm not because I'm not a developer to, you know, like play around with our data. So, get, I would like to get some practice. Um, hi, my name is Eric Schwartz. I work at a shop in town called TableXI, which is a development shop where I'm a developer. Um, and I'm just sort of here taking the temperature and seeing what kind of, see what kind of projects are, are happening. Because I'm uh, uh, super interested in all the data that's available at this point. So curious to see what people are doing with it. Uh, my name is Maya Lovich. Uh, I do academic research um, at the Spencer Foundation and at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, where I work on topics in education policy. So a lot of my work uh, involves linking up high school data sets with uh, other longitudinal data sets regarding to student outcomes. So the idea is not only can we see what high schools are doing for their kids in terms of test scores, we can see if high schools are sending their kids to college and keeping them out of crime and not getting pregnant before uh, they turn 18. So it's great stuff. Uh, but I work primarily in data, and, and I'm here because I'm trying to learn different kinds of data analysis languages. Um, I'm Jason Early. I'm a Designer, I run a small creative studio here in town, focusing on visual communication and uh, design process being applied to various different applications. Um, I've also mentored through the UX track at Starter League over here and have been for about a year. So uh, that type of kind of close association to programming data, APIs, and everything kind of starts to boil over a little bit. And it's it's interesting to finally uh, start to understand a little bit more of what. Um, development track teaches there, being a designer and how it starts to utilize it for the whole team. I'm Kirk Lashley. I'm a software engineer and I'm looking for really hard problems to solve. I like to solve hard problems. So I'm going to hear people doing them. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, my name is Aaron Silvers and uh, while I'm not here representing them, my day job is with the uh, Department of Defense and the Department of Education, and I am uh, shepherding an open uh, standard for basically for structured data based on uh, inspired by activity streams uh, for focusing on learning, education, training, and performance, improved performance. And uh, basically, uh, I'm here. Uh, out of personal interest, just to see who is drawn to this space, to this space to solve these kinds of problems, and how can we help? Um, my name is Josh Kalov. I'm a GIS data analyst at uh, Nokia. Um, outside of that, I do a lot with uh, mapping and data analysis of school-related uh, issues, mostly Chicago Public School. I'm Gabrielle Lyon. I'm the co-founder and um, executive director of Project Exploration. We're a science education nonprofit organization here in Chicago. And we've been working for the last 13 years to try to figure out how do you get students who are being pushed out of school to have great experiences with science and technology with scientists um, out of school. And um, so we've been doing a lot with uh, uh, retrospective data and what kind of happens to them. Um, but most specifically right now, uh, we're working with uh, Josh and some of the other folks here to um, try to understand what is the opportunity landscape for out of school time in science and technology. There's um, And trying to frankly use that data to help people get organized and actually are able to map pathways. So there's maybe you know nearly 2,000 opportunities in the course of a year, but nobody knows that. And, um, and most of all, students don't know it. So really interested in basically how the data could help actually drive education. I'm Rob. I'm a database developer for a nonprofit. I'm primarily working on a program evaluation database for um, measuring up against benchmarks in the Obamacare um, home visitation component. Um, I'm a one-person shop, so I, uh, my coworkers don't really understand my work, and I'm not really aware of what other data um, and techniques are out there in the world today. So, um, 
I'm Rachel Cabron. Uh, I'm an independent strategy consultant. Um, I focus on doing decision making, um, helping nonprofits or individuals and organizations make better decisions, um, thinking a little bit <coughs> Um, so the intersection of data and policy is sort of my favorite. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm a senior analyst at Northwestern University in the medical school. Uh, I'm also a visiting scholar at Iowa State University in the School of Education. Uh, before this, I was a, a policy and policy advisor at the Iowa Department of Education. Uh, my interest is in analysis, program evaluation, all things data. Uh, I'll be for the data viz group, I'll be teaching a class on ggplot2 and a series of classes that Josh Doyle and I are going to put on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to talk to you about that. Later. Um, uh, and so, interest in open data, open gov, and, and everything that just is about. I'm I have a PhD in mathematics. My my main interests are in things, the things related to predictive modeling, machine learning, but any, anything, anything related to uh, manage, managing and organizing data. Uh, my name is Matt Gee. I'm a PhD student at the University of Chicago, and I'm a co-conspirator uh, with Nick and Youngjin, and uh, I, I help run the Center for Impact Measurement at uh, out of the Harris School of Public Policy. And uh, two big announcements. Uh, on that, just to throw out to this group uh, coming up um, this month. One is uh, we're holding our first data camp, which is a, a two week crash course on open source uh, data tools for um, nonprofits and uh, master students. Um, we're focusing on um, mostly on Google Refine and R, um, but we would love anyone who's uh, got experience with either of those tools. Um, <clears throat> that would like to come and help, essentially, in the breakout sessions and answer people's questions. Um, we love your support and help on that. Um, and then also, our site will be going live uh, next week, where everyone can, uh, anyone who wants to can create uh, a profile um, of, kind of your skills uh, as a data analyst uh, that will help connect, um, uh, essentially, individuals with those skills with, with the nonprofits and We'd love for you guys to pressure test that and uh, fill out a profile, and um, you'll be getting links to both of those uh, in the coming week. Hi, I'm Forrest Gregg. I'm a PhD student at the University of Chicago and a collaborator with uh, Open City, which has a number of um, government projects here in Chicago. Uh, my name is Philip Mack. I'm a recent graduate of. SCAD at uh, Savannah, and my um, <coughs> my major one was graphic design, and I did a thesis on how to use basically open data to inform and as well as um, create dialogue in public spaces. So using computer computing to improve the public space, essentially. Um, <coughs> I'm Chris, I just got done with my PhD, and I think I'm really interested in finding out what you guys are doing. My name is Kevin. I'm a web designer and developer uh, involved in a couple of startups, but I'm paid by a software company in the financial industry. And uh, I guess I'm interested in uh, knowing more about, uh, with lots of big data, how to, like how do humans process that? Like, how do you organize <laughs> it so that it's human readable, not just machine readable? Um, so that we can actually process the information instead of uh, a bunch of computers. Hi, uh, my name is Avi. Um, I'm a software developer at the Onset Prevention Fund, which does uh, early childhood education, basically uh, kindergarten and below, to get kids prepared for kindergarten so that they are, you know, able to kind of keep up the rest of the way. At least that's the theory. Um, my job is to replace their website so that we can collect, do a better job collecting data on, on the kids and the various programs we run. And uh, so I'll be looking for insights for you guys about standard ways of collecting data. Uh, and then I'll uh, have to interact with researchers. Uh, but yeah, I'm ex uh, I, this is my second time here. I had a great time last uh, 
last month met some met some really um, met some great people, useful contacts. Cool. I'm Casey. Uh, by day, I work on digital strategy and digital reputation at a PR agency, and I'm interested in how data is organized and how it can tell a story, how it can solve problems, just the capabilities of this big data collection. And then on a personal note, my dad works in the urban planning sector, so I'm trying to bring this new wave of technology to his thought process and maybe help out with some of his nonprofit ideas in the future. I'm Steve Winter. I'm an MBA PhD student at the University of Chicago. Uh, and I'm looking to get out of biomedical research and more into uh, medicine and software. So I'm actually working with a guy who here, but uh, we're working on an urban planning uh, web app uh, with the Open City Group. Um, and I've been to one of these before, and it was fun, so I'm anxious to talk to people. Uh, my name is Tom Caswell. I'm a physics PhD student at UChicago, and I'm just looking for another project to work on. Okay, I'm Mrs. Wu. My first name is Grady, so the Chinese name don't even try. It's the Chin. <laughs> I work for Cook County Health and Hospital System. There's a 6,000 plus employee. Uh, I have a PhD in research, and my dissertation was focused on how the you know, health security behavior. So that's my job in the Cook County, use number to manage people. Then how do, you know, why uh, people, I mean patients go to the emergency room, and how, how can we direct them to go to their primary care instead of use a very expensive emergency room. Also, we also uh, try to, you know, promote, perform, promote the doctor's performance. Before we are uh, counting them, they see like one patient, two patients an hour. So we put on the website, collect data, and publish it to everybody. So everybody open domain for everybody to see everybody's uh, performance. Then who start their performance? So this is a called a Hosan effect. So we create a Hosan effect to make doctors see patient more aggressively. <laughs> okay. So that's basically my job, and I've been there first job, only job okay, in the United States, 24 years so far. <clears throat> My name is Jason Almarigi. Um I am a uh, developmental psychologist uh, with a specialization in psychometrics. Um, I currently do a lot of evaluation work in the Flint and Genesee County area of Michigan. Um, uh, I'm here, I have a relationship, and this is why I'm in Chicago uh, periodically. Um, but uh, I, I came across this under the meetup, and I thought this might be an interesting place uh, to meet like finding folks. Um, my sense is that I'm not a software engineer, so it's it's a little bit interesting. But uh, I think there's opportunities for sharing the mountains of data that I have. And creative minds here. I'll talk more about that. Um, I'm Becky Levin, as Nick mentioned, and from Ann Arbor Victoria Children's Hospital of Chicago. Oh. I run the Strengthening Chicago's Youth or Sky Violence Prevention Collaborative. Um, so I. Got involved um, at the Data Diet in May. We were one of the community organizations that participated. Um, and I think my interest in continuing is um, really about our um, the members of staff at the micro level. One of the things that we really want to do is help foster connections between community organizations with data problems and people like those sitting around the table. Um, and at the macro level, we really want to um, improve organizations' capacity to access data, to use the data they have, and to have systems in place so that those connections are a bit easier to find. Uh, I'm Tom. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at UChicago in the uh, cosmology group. And I'm uh, interested in uh, intersecting data and policy, so I'm kind of here to see what My name is Erin. I work for Citizen Schools Illinois. Um, Citizen Schools partners with underperforming middle schools to lengthen the school day uh, by an additional three hours. Um, and I moved here recently from Boston, where I worked in our national headquarters and helping found um, our state here. And there, I got a lot of coaching on um, both data analysis and talking about our data. And we are introducing Mike Flex Tool. I'm just the data expert here, rather than being so. We're at 1871 right now. That's how you're signing. Oh, nice. Um, my name is David. I build websites and use application uh, websites for the Chicago Tribune and run a small nonprofit that uh, focuses on computer refurbishing, recycling, 
practical computing skills training for the future. My name is Joe Dramuska. I work with David at the Chicago Tribune on the news applications team. We uh, basically are in charge of doing whatever we can to make the news work better on the web or outside of the normal CMS that uh, you may think of when you go to ChicagoTribune.com and can do. Uh, so that includes things like Crown Chicago, which we'll be showing you tonight. I'm also the co-founder of Open Government Chicago. I see a few faces who have seen at those meetups, but for folks who haven't heard about it, Open Government Chicago is a group uh, in a lot of ways overlapping mindset with uh, Data Podlock and some other civic technology groups. Um, the, a lot of open city people, and so yeah, from the after data tech on a regular basis, uh, think about each other in Open Government Chicago. But we're on meetup, and we get together about once a month, usually about the third Thursday. And those meetups, um, I'm really excited that Open City has gotten these hack nights going, but people <coughs> wanted to see this happening and hadn't been. Those, those other meetups are more usually about sort of presentations and mingling and networking. Uh, a lot of times we have government officials come in and show their stuff, whatever they're excited about these days. Um, sometimes we have people show projects like things that might get built here. So if you're interested, check that out. You can open up Chicago on meetup. Um, so this process of meeting. So how many people have had a look at, can someone kick the projector and like, make sure it's on VGA? I think I saw you just came on before, so I think. How many people have had a chance to look at crime.chicago.com? Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll do a little bit of a, of a tour to show the folks who haven't seen it what's going on. It's um, There's not a lot of different items to show, although you can spend plenty of time looking at the data that's there as you get to it. Uh, We'll say a couple things, but we would love to have this be a very uh, interactive, discussion-oriented session. So um, as far as I'm concerned, people should ask questions pretty much as soon as they come up. We don't have like, a very formal presentation. Uh, so let's just uh, first make sure that we get the projector. So I hope you're all from the not giving a VJ option, which makes me think you should probably just do the approved search. Oh, okay. That's a question. Chicago basically originated with an observation from our Metro editor that this skyrocketing homicide rate in Chicago at this time that we tried to do something and analyze that data and made it um, more usable to the people. Uh, so then Dave and I and our colleague Heather, who unfortunately couldn't come to our application, but she's definitely one of the three musketeers that brought this site to you. Uh, we put our heads together and kind of considered how we could could do this, and this is what we came up with. So the site is at crime.chicago.com. That's the starting point. Basically, we're trying to start with a state level overview. Um, this is actually not where we start the design, but this is where we actually kind of distilled our idea. This is where we figured people would want to start. So throughout the site, our goal is to present statistics and context. There's an enormous amount of data in the city's crime <coughs> data set, but absolute numbers from that data set can be very misleading, and so we'll talk about some of the details about how we did that. But one of the key things, as you'll see in this table, is that when we count the number of crimes that happen in different communities in Chicago, we always represent them as a, as a ratio of the population in that area, because um, Austin, for example, is the single largest community area. Uh, uh, and so it always has a lot of crime, which is count the number of crimes that ends up at the top of the list, but it's actually down here, you know, solidly in the 10th in terms of violent crime, and so on, because there's a lot of people there, too. Um, so, again, that was one of our goals. So, on this page, you can see all the community areas listed originally ranked by the uh, violent crime per thousand citizens, but you can sort by either these other columns, you can also sort by name, uh, area number. Um, 
the compromise we have to make for the map here is it's really hard to get all the names that can there to show up on this map. Is, uh, we'll get into as much technology as people want, but uh, I'm sure we use tile mill to make this map, and it has relatively limited precision in terms of placing labels on the map. So I spent a whole bunch of time nudging text around, and I was like, forget this is a mess. Use numbers instead. Uh, it turns out there's Chicago community areas have kind of official numbers, too. It's the way that does always work. Okay. Um, so when you uh, click on a uh, community area over here, you can see numbers that are essentially a shadow of these. Uh, they show the absolute numbers as well as the uh, rank of thousand citizens and list the ranks. You can see it all in one place. And then on those bubbles or on the names here, you can click to get a detail view, which is really where we kind of spent the lion's share of our time on it. So for each of the 77 community areas in the city, this page looks kind of like this. So I'll start to the map that shows the 30 days of most recent data that are available. Uh, the city's prime data is uh, always about a week behind. So it's not the last 30 days, but it's easier to say that. So uh, the numbers that you've been seeing are reprised here and broken down by categories. Um, you can click on the categories to see just those dots. If you want to see what's going on nearby, maybe you live near the edge of your community, you can click on show crack reports in neighboring communities, and we'll um, fetch the rest of the dots and show you what's going on in those places. You can click on any of these dots and see a little more detail about what happened in that event. Um, the, the not exact address, but it obscures the addresses down the block level, but a more specific address, the nature of the crime. <coughs> the location is a sort of type of location, there's more of this along the page, but this would tell you what happened at a bar or at a school, et cetera, um, and a case ID if you want to cross with this better information. So you can see this with all these dots. Um, and then if you scroll down, we get into some uh, broader context for these numbers. So there's a little bit of context on the left, where the community area is in the city, some demographic statistics, um, most of which come from the city's data board as well. And then we provide a year's worth of crime data in this section, so each bar here is a week, the last 52 weeks of crime. If you hover over any of the bars, you can see the breakdown of crimes happening in that week of that type. And of course, at the right, you can see in the summer for the last 30 days and 365 days in total. And then at the bottom of the page, um, we have a, a longer term perspective. So this is all the data that's available. Basically, it goes back to 2001, January 1st, 2001. So we just have a line chart uh, that shows you that. You'll see for most of the city, actually, the trend lines are going basically down, which is nice. Uh, not just here, but most of them. Although also the violent crimes are mostly flat, actually. Um, if you hover over these, you also get the numbers. But when we have time, we'll go back and and sort of break down this for the different categories like this, but this is kind of what this one landed. And then at the very bottom, and those are all here to date. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so that there's a useful comparison to this. <clears throat> right, we didn't want to do all year for everything, but the current year and then have a partial year for the current year and have that be the same. Is this based on the police report or what? This is based on the data at data.cityofchicago.org, and we'll get into some more detail about oh, that okay. data. Yeah. So I don't know the crime data that well. What are uh, quality of what kinds? Well, so that's our own invention, and I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So let's just finish with the page briefly. Um, when stories run in the paper on the website that are linked to locations um, that are crime stories, they'll appear on the community area that they relate to. Uh, this is kind of easy to miss. But I think it's kind of a cool feature. Uh, we didn't want to overplay it because a lot of times these stories have already been seen, and that's why it's not the first thing you see on the page. But it is easy to overlook, so I think it's kind of good to point out. And then where a crime happens. So the city uh, police reports crime <coughs> are sort of description of the nature of the place, again, as I mentioned with the dots. Uh, so these are just various labels that they use. So they say this crime happened at an apartment store, or on a train, or on a platform. <laughs> There's some curiosities with these, as well as a lot of other things with the data in general, which we can talk about to the extent that people here want to uh, learn some more stories about the city's data. Uh, but for now, that's kind of what we have. So, um, what, what was coverage? Oh. Coverage is the headline. Coverage of the newspaper. So, let's talk a little bit about some of the choices we made here. Again, one of the things we always want to do is provide context, so everything is kind of put. Uh, in relationship to other areas of the city and other periods of time, so that no one gets kind of carried away with the absolute numbers. 
Another thing that we found is that um, if you look at the details of the city's crime data portal, there's a lot of stuff in there. So over the last um, 11 years, there's over 5 million reports. 5 million 40,000, I think, is the current uh, upper limit. Um, and a lot of that is not really all that interesting. Like insurance fraud shows up in there. And lost passport. Those are my two sort of favorite inconsequential crimes. <laughs> so one of the things that we wanted to do was filter that out, basically consider that noise. So uh, also I should mention we were essentially inspired by crime.mailingtimes.com, which was built by a colleague of ours in the Los Angeles Times. Um, in a lot of ways, sort of structurally it's similar, um, although we definitely took variations as based on our local needs and just what's different now. <coughs> they did. But one of the things they do is they broke down crime into violent crime and property crime, basically into these, um, I think they just used four of these five, I can't remember, I think maybe they don't separate out from those social saw, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, but they sort of keyed on those. And so we said, okay, that's probably a good way to start filtering. And so what happens, and this is explained a little bit in the about section of this site, which is linked somewhere, which was pointed out to me, reads as though it was a bit of an afterthought. It was a little bit you're really focused on this stuff. But we tried to explain some things. And so some of this is written out more, and if you find that things are really unclear, you should let us know. We'll try and write out more explanation. But for now, I will tell you. Um, Violent crimes and property crimes are coded based on the city's own data about what are index crimes. So index crimes are crimes that cities are reported to, required to report up to the FBI for national crime statistics. It includes um, things of these categories, but not necessarily all things of these categories. So probably the majority of crimes in the city's data set are simple assaults and simple batteries. Those are not counted here because those are, um, I don't know if this is categorically true, but essentially they're misdemeanor crimes. They tend to be things that get reported but don't amount to really serious incidents. So scuffles, uh, scuffles yeah, threats, you know. Um, and so those are not, there's a, there's a separate data file on the data portal that lists all the IUCR codes, which is a Illinois Uniform Crime Reporting Code, which is codes under which data gets reported up to the state and federal authorities. And uh, all the crimes in the city's data set have those codes. So if it's in that data set, marked as I for index, then we included in here. So we took all the index crimes and we sort them based our own judgment in the violent and property crimes. Do those differentials relate to what the police action is in response? Um, I don't think so because remember these are reports. So they're made there's all kinds of different you mean, you mean like No, so in other words if the police get called they may show up and it may be a scuffle and therefore it gets recorded as just the not something that has to go up to the FBI, right. as opposed to if you do, you know, you arrest them, right. or well, if um, you do something. You know, so in other words, I don't see here how the actual police action is connected to right. any of That's a good question. Some of that is um, not manifestly obvious from the data that's published, and may not be things that the city is ready to make categorical statements about, because I think that. Um, Although it's, although it's respectable that they've made this much data available, the fact is it's pretty clear that the process for collecting and publishing this data is still evolving, and there's a lot of things that are kind of in various degrees of flux, um, including, for example, the fact that the data changes. So individual crimes that may be classified as assault today may become homicide in five years even. There's, a, there's a, one of the homicides, you know, they're talking about the homicide counts here, and one of the 400 plus homicides in Chicago It's actually someone who was wounded in 1986, but he died in 2012. And so um, the data, is one of the things we've had to deal with is the fact that um, the data is changing all the time. And we're trying to keep as much in sync as we can. <coughs> so do you have any sense of who's looking at this and what your traffic is like and what people are? Uh, yeah, a little. Let me get to that in a minute, though. Um, so just to finish with this, quality of life crimes are not index crimes. But as we looked at the data, we decided that there are certain kinds of crimes people would have questions about anyway. And so we basically coded everything that's in the data that has a primary classification of criminal damage, narcotics, or prostitution as quality of life crimes. Now, I'm a little bit, um, that may have been a little bit casual because I think, especially like for narcotics, that sort of goes the whole gamut from minor possession to, uh, to distribution, uh, all that kind of stuff. And so there are probably some narcotics crimes that are just as inconsequential as simple assault and simple battery, but we include them all right now because we haven't had kind of an opportunity to 
dial in on where that should be. Uh, will, so that, a, will that distinction, will, will that break down the same way the assault does now that they're going to start ticketing for marijuana? Uh, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, we would need, we would need to change our data uh, ETL process, I guess is what you call it, to, to make discretionary choices about that. I'll be honest, there's also um, there's a possession of synthetic marijuana crime, which actually doesn't even get counted here because it's not in the city's classification data set. It's neither indexed or not indexed. It's not there. There's like a handful of other minor codes that aren't in that. We haven't kind of gone through the research process to say, well, it's not quite here, where should we put it? So there's a couple of things that fall out. There's also a decent number of crimes in the data set that don't have locations at all. So those don't show up anywhere in this application because everything here is predicated on the fact that we have to go put it in the community area. There's also a small number of crimes that we can't put in a community area because the precision of the GIS data is not quite what it should be. So um, basically, we have a process, I'll talk about this in a minute too, where we take the the geocode that's on each prior in the city's data set and try and locate it in a community area, and most of them land in there successfully. If it's not, we try again with like an eighth of a uh, mile buffer, and um, it fits in just one out of them put in, and then there's like 30 or 40 out of 5 million that, um, that are not conclusively in only one community area after you try some of the strategies, so they're essentially going on the board in this app. Can you give us a sense of what a good number means uh, for numbers that are missing in geocode? Um, you know, one of the other things we've been doing is sort of, uh, so we can talk more about our sort of process of loading the data and then trying to keep it in sync. But one of the things, we have a nightly process that doesn't quite work as well as we thought it would, so we have a secondary audit process that tries to sort of find out what part of the cracks. And I've been running that one manually every day just to kind of monitor things. And, uh, Many days there are about a thousand new rows, and many days about a hundred of those might not have locations. But then it will also happen that on a subsequent day they might have a location. That's another thing that definitely changes. Uh, so, look at when you made the unsold. unsold. Uh, there's really not any clear way to get to the place called the clearance rate, and um, they don't basically go back and deep note that in this data set. So it would be a pretty uh, substantial research project to connect these crimes to any other resource where we could, where we could actually mark that. All right, that was my next question, yeah. actually. You use only that particular data set. Yes. <coughs> yes. You don't link it to any medical data, for example. Yeah. That's an interesting people. thought. Um, no, right now, this is exclusive from the city's data source. A couple of things that we've thought about, um, our colleague Tracy Swartz at the Red Eye has been doing a project to track homicides. Uh, she has data back to 2007, where she has pretty much every victim of homicide tracked. And um, she started to add those uh, these case numbers. They call RD code the city. I can't remember what it stands for. Actually, not just the city, but the penal system. Um, so in theory, we could link her homicides to these. But the way the app is designed right now, these dots are only here for 30 days. By the time she knows the homicide and number, the likelihood that someone's going to find among all these dots, the one to click on it and see that we connected to our thing, is pretty low. So in the future, it would be a nice thing to be able to do, but we need to kind of imagine a design that makes that worthwhile. We also have a colleague on um, the Breaking News desk, uh, in case, who's been collecting a lot of data about shootings in the city, because the city doesn't actually report shootings as separate from these other crimes. Sometimes you can, you know, there's a solid handgun, you can figure it's probably a bullet, but you can't really get that. And so he's kind of trying to track that independently so we can have some counts. Uh, but, but basically right now, the only data is the city's data flow. Yeah, you know, when you do the research, the numerator is important in counting up the event. However, your denominator is also important. How current your census data over there is community survey? The, the census is, data is from the 2010 census. 2010, oh, it's yeah. released already, huh? Well, 2010 uh, stuff came out last summer, okay. and the city actually published the tabulation of population by, uh, by community area and PDF. So that's what those numbers I think the Census Bureau also have a community survey, right? Every year they have. The community survey just the 2011 one year data <coughs> just came out, but that okay. only gets down to um, I think there are like 20 sub areas of the city that you can use, and Austin is the only community area that itself is fully accounted for in that data. So it would be, it'd be tricky to keep that. Yeah, market. because the, the, what, you know, depending on the denominator, your total figure is changing. 
Yeah, but really important. come around 2015, it'll be a harder question as to whether we should try and adapt to use the ACS, which would be challenging to accurately roll up to community areas, mm -hmm. or whether we should just stick with the decennial census, which is more accurate, but older, less academic. Uh, when it comes to that, can you well, um, this location is, it tends to be pretty accurate uh, from what we found for various times we've used this data. You know, you can sort of have an area of interest and um, see this happen on a street, or if you're looking at, say, we did some stuff with crimes at nursing homes a few years ago, and sometimes the nursing home is a location. So um, when you get down to this, you can kind of see that we don't summarize that much except for at the very bottom where we have the last 30 days by these. Uh, but there's also some issues. We did a story in about crime on the CTA, um, and we found some curious anomalies. So um, John Hilkovich, our transit, uh, transportation reporter, wanted to kind of dig into this, and we started assessing this data for that. And we wanted to tell you about what crime happened at CTA platforms, which, which ones had what amount of crime. And we found that sometimes this location is CTA platform. We found that maybe 5% of the crimes that are labeled as CTA platform are further than an eighth of a mile from any actual CTA platform based on the geocodes that the city designs. And so this goes down to the fact that the way the data is collected, the, the reasons they do what they, they collect what they have, are not maybe totally tuned for the close look that they're starting to get now. And so this stuff is going to be evolving. This kind of goes back to your question. From a data management standpoint, you just said that we're looking at a snapshot of 30 days. Thirty days from now, you already have this snapshot. So why don't you keep this available someplace? Um, like you just did the snapshot. So why does it just go away? Right, and we could we could reproduce it, but we wanted to have a site that was not utterly intimidating to a, a somewhat casual user. And so we get into user interface challenges as to mm -hmm. how to help someone navigate data. So there's not really any interactivity besides some clicking on the map <coughs> because. We thought that making that understandable for a casual user would be a big challenge. Uh, there are also some performance questions. So to be able to pull this together for um, just 30 days, we basically can kind of pre-compute all this overnight during the update process in about half an hour. But for people to arbitrarily pick a date range and get the crimes for that, um, with the system we have right now would not be satisfactory. We can throw a lot of hardware at it, we might not make it fast enough, and then we might also be able to what you're suggesting. Right. So one of the one of the issues there is that we wanted to see the viability of the site, especially with respect to the sort of public interest in it, before we made a major investment in hardware. Um, that would be a significant ongoing cost of the tribute. So which is probably a good uh, hold that question for a good time to come back to the traffic question. So um, we've done very little promotion of this. Uh, we tweeted about it when we launched it in September and uh, got some interest and enthusiasm. Um, and uh, the news staff are starting to routinely link it to major crime stories on the front page of the website. So they'll like, have a story about crime, then it'll be crime, you know, learn more about crime in the city. But we did find that um, the more they do that, the more they're driving traffic to it. So we're getting on the order of maybe three to 5,000 visitors a day, um, which is pretty good. Uh, we spend yeah. over, um, over an average of about two minutes on the site. Yeah, people always expect me to feel good. Yeah, people yeah. spend a little bit of time filming around. Which is good. So, um, we, um, one of the things that we hope to do before too long is make it so that when you're actually reading a story, primarily, that we could have an area in the margin that would recognize that it was a crime story and which neighborhood it was in, and show you something like this in the margin. One of the problems is that a lot of the stories are about more than one community, especially on the weekend, they tend to be roll ups that cover all the major crimes. And so uh, it's kind of a design challenge where you have a, you know, one to n of these that we need to make them all. Um, for us, I have a question. Yeah, on the front page, you really uh, you have, you have highlight the rate. And with that, as you get down to debate about what the, what the, what the uh, denominator should be, whether it makes sense to divide by a nice county population. Um, we didn't have much for debate because we didn't really have many options. I mean, it is, it's fair to say that um, areas of the city have different populations at different times of day when crimes are happening. So for example, there's a lot of crime in the loop um, because a lot of people are there during the day, but the population of the loop is not exactly accurate. 
but we just didn't really have much to go on. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, if you guys have ideas about how we could uh, do better with that, I well, it was, I just, it was like, there's something that when Open City was working on um, uh, a similar site, that was when we went back, there was a conversation going back and forth whether it actually gave you the right, whether it gave you the right sense of what was going on. Because <laughs> what, is, what is, you get a sense, a lot of people interpret a race as a risk, and it's just not exactly, if you're going to do that, then you really need to think about what you're dividing. That's probably true, but I think it's still better than an absolute number. Uh, but you're right. You have a good point. But um, you know, and I wonder if there's like the American Community Survey has like sort of computer information. I don't know what, how much time of day computer stuff it has, but like, how much you got sort of. I was, yeah, I was only able to find daytime, seemingly accurate daytime, nighttime population numbers specifically for the movie. Um, but uh, as the find is actually a larger area than the community area known as the loop. Um, and as far as we can tell, that's the one that's probably the most skewed. Um, and yeah, um, you know, just from anecdotal evidence, the neighborhoods that are the most violent and have the highest levels of crime don't have as widely fluctuating as they come in next time. Didn't ZTA come in to take some of their data? There's a lot of things we data already available that actually probably yeah. be relevant. They don't technically know where people get off. Mm. Which is one of the challenges. They know where people get off. Uh, they have counts. Yeah. Sorry, please. So I, I think actually I have someone comment. So I, I think three follow up things. Can you close that the second? Sure. Because I think this is actually similar to the loop issue. So like UIC is there. And I assume that a lot of crime is handled by like a university police yeah, department. Right. So for some of these community areas, you might want to have like a little note or something just to make sure that there's some additional context provided. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, that's good. And then um, thinking about the ability to kind of connect this to other data sets to paint a more comprehensive picture, I wonder if at least a goal could be for the homicides um, to be able to link to continuing coverage in the Tribune, um, you know, kind of along the lines of what's done, um, like with the DC project, to kind of personalize some of what's going on, that these are not just numbers, that these are, are people, and here's what's happened with their. Yeah, I mean, one thing we could easily do would be to just have a specific sort of homicide variant of the coverage section that data from Trace's project and <coughs> four bronze individual victims. Um, yeah, basically have that role. But I would also love to be able to, like when I click on a homicide dot, I would love to be able to see so that's right. I, that, that, the problem with that is that these are only here for 30 days. Right. It's true that a lot of people would say show me only homicide right. and then they look at that more than other things. But um, the gap between her Worrying about and her finding out the RD number for it, not to be able to link them, while someone still has a chance to find on a map, made that a little further off. Right. But, so the yeah, and just to go to that really quickly, there is uh, Red Eye Chicago, Tracy right. Schwartz has uh, a homicide tracker, and so one of the points was uh, this project was not to replicate that. Um, and personally, I think that a lot of the news narrative around crime centers on homicides. And there's that can be a problematic narrative in a lot of ways. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is, is provide this more holistic view of what's happening in the city. Um, Joe did a data analysis or helped with the data analysis earlier in the summer um, about who's getting killed in shootings and homicides, and it's by and large young black men. Um, and so we can personalize that. Maybe that's a little voyeuristic. Um, in certain ways, uh, we think that this uh, gives you a little more nuanced view of, of what's actually happening. Well, I guess part of what I was suggesting was personalizing not just the incident itself, but also to be able to follow that. Because there will be, right. you know, in the homicides at least, there will be, for some of them, some news coverage of convictions and that sort of thing. Right. So, so to are, also have it be... As an aside, we're working with Tracy to add sort of charges or sort of second level. Yeah. So right now her thing has a read more about the search is usually the incident and uh, so she's collecting second stories. That's it's usually not yeah. a much longer chain than that, but so we'll add that to uh, homicide stuff right as you 
And then the third thing I think is, so when thinking about the last 30 days or the last 365 days, you know, I want um, community organizations to be able to use this information. I think it will be really helpful for them, like in writing grants or for advocacy purposes. And I think if there could be a way, even if you can't keep all of the data, like even if you don't allow the user to be able to look at any selected time period, if they can at least um, have the ability to look at a neat period of time. So in other words, I think that would be really hard for a community organization to look at the year-to-year -year numbers and be able to write a grant and say, well, this year represents September 25th, 2011 to September 24th, 2012. I think you know they want to be able to report on that year, I, it just, if that makes sense. Um, well, that, uh, that leads to, well, I'll save it for a second. Okay. But, uh, I was going to say, back to the user, I'm kind of on the user side and how you make this actionable. Like, even if you had an RSS feed where you could download a PDF version or a printable version, then I, as a person in a community, could get a trigger on my tax that the updated, you know, vital statistics or whatever you want to call that, whatever you call this, is, <coughs> that could show up as a PDF and I can keep I mean, you're producing it already. So even if you could just well, take that. Yeah, that's actually a couple steps of extra complexity. So, so, but if there was a way to like have a feed, I could get an alert that it's been updated. That would be something that I could opt to get. Yeah. It would give you some information about what neighborhoods or what people are interested in. You could select neighborhoods. But it also would be great to be able to kind of somehow take this snapshot that you beautifully created and, and be able to walk away to use that or share with somebody else. Um, to your point, actually, <coughs> yeah, yeah. point out one of the ways we find out some of the problems with our data load process is actually someone who uh, was looking at River West and she's like, you have what looks like data discrepancies on two different computers with the same page and uh, it's got a combination of caching and peculiarities with the city's data load uh, and us learning more about other data loads. We would like to do Hopefully, fairly soon, something that would give you snapshots three months back or a three month window, yeah, window a six month window. You get like here. So make this completely to your free form. form. You could say, "Show me." The well, that's form. not exactly my point. Was just that I think for somebody to use this for like an advocacy purpose, they just like are going to want a, a neat period of time, not right. like reflecting whatever day they happen to go there. Well, so the the other thing about that is, of course, the city's data portal is. It's available. It's actually you this can do a so lot much nicer. Well, so one of the things that it lacks is the uh, community. Thank you. For that. Thank you. <laughs> that's the sort of community area narrowing. But I can show you a trick about that. Um, well, let me take a second first. How long should we be going? Oh, uh, I'm excited about questions. Uh, I can talk. People stop me. Okay, because there's, <laughs> there's, there's one more presentation on the research time, right? Thank Mine you. will not be interesting. So, what's the tribunal's interest? Uh, it's part of the public journalism interest yeah. in covering the city. By the way, it's a cool stuff, but not convenient for anybody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, you have a lot of things where you have to forward, but you cannot forward. Um, this mapping library should actually be pretty iPad friendly. I've managed to get uh, one hour. This year, but you have these oh, other the graphics, right? Say, I think that if you tap on this, you'll actually get the monster. Um, I could be wrong, but we, we did our best to make it responsibly designed, but it's just well, it's what you can do before you basically get to oh, it's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay, go ahead. You can ask or something. Oh, well, I was going to ask you is when you guys were designing the, the reports that you, you created, what were the uses that you had in mind for, for who would be accessing? The service and how they would be using the site. Uh, we thought we were doing persona driven design, but it was a little flabby, perhaps. No, no, no. Um, I'm no, 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 I'm actually, I'm no, no we, we just had a sort of idea that there was a uh, general, sort of civically interested nerd who would look closely at charts and tables. Uh, but it wasn't much better defined than that. So. Oh, oh. Slightly disagree with okay. you. Um, I mean, there were, there were a couple of other personas that we were interested in. 
One is the person who's moving either within the city or to the city. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who's going to maybe come and use the site a couple times a year, but it'll be very important for them. Um, one, uh, another use case is people who live in troubled areas um, who can use this tool to potentially um, help navigate those areas. We had some uh, user testing and we had a resident of Englewood come in and it, uh, we, it was news to me that a lot of people in Englewood actually use Tracy's homicide map um, to help kind of figure out their way through the neighborhood. Um, and so his perspective is actually really, really valuable. Um, and getting some user testing as part of our process is really valuable. Um, and then the last one was actually, or another one, it was a more minor case, but it was still pretty important to us, was small businesses, churches, uh, neighborhood institutions um, that might be checking uh, something like this every single day. I, I was talking to somebody who works for a housing organization um, that tries to place people in, in houses. And they wanted exactly this kind of a, a roll up, um, as well as that long term kind of 10 year perspective um, to be able to show people and also make choices about um, how they could place people in affordable homes. I'm sorry. <laughs> how many how many people internal to the truth are using using this now as opposed to using other forms of um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, they don't have to through us, so we don't necessarily know. Um, yeah. One just kind of interesting anecdote. There's a story. I think it was uh, last Sunday, or was it Monday? So about a week, in the last week or so, they did a story about uh, neighbor block associations. And this Monday, yeah. And um, we basically used sort of the, we were able to export the data from this application for the community areas where those blockers were, and helped them to make a map that was able to. Uh, get crime trend data and put the dots on the map uh, while sort of adhering to that property quality of life violent crime filter that moves out some of the noise as a more. Uh, and we've maybe done a couple of small reports based on that kind of stuff. And then, of course, they can look around. I, I would like to hear some more stories from my colleagues about, yeah, hey, I wrote this story, I got this lead, and this is what I saw here. But I, so, one, one last question, and then I would shut up. Um, <laughs> uh, how will you gauge if it's been successful? Um, I think a combination of traffic and feedback. Yeah. So you have goals. You have, what's that? Do you have goals in mind? I uh, wanted to take over the world. Well, no, we're not, we're not, this was not a very sort of metric-driven operation. It was really just the, it needs to be a thing. Let's make a thing. We took about five weeks of active development to build it. Up here, three of us, we uh, expect to add stuff. Uh, we have at least a few ideas of things we want to add, sort of independent of people telling us this is good, bad, I want this, I don't want that, uh, before we really adapt to that kind of feedback. But uh, pretty, pretty willing about that. How long of a commitment has the Tribune made to stuff? Um, I mean, it, it's pretty much cost free now. You know, I kind of watch that audit every day, and we have the server that runs on our server and everything, so it's not using for successful incremental costs. If we decided to step up to something that would allow sort of very flexible querying and interactivity, then it would cost more than it would be more of a community. But uh, for now, it's the foreseeable future. And this was three developers, uh, pretty much full time on this project for about six weeks. You don't have an API for installing this? No. Uh, we'll show you one. I keep putting it up. I'll show you one thing that we can share at uh, the API thing. For now, the fact that the city provides the lion's share of its data it seems to give us the opportunity to say, well, we get the data on the API a lot. And one of the, yeah, one of the models on the team is show your work, and one of the ways that we'd like to show our work is clean up some of the importing. Yeah, sorry. So, so let me just, uh, yeah. it's not it's a great secret, but it's got one to put it on the so briefly, for the merits, uh, as was mentioned, uh, I was part of the data kind, uh, data diving with the and um, actually built out there what became the core of our data loader. And I'll have this be really quick. Here we go. So uh, you can go to GitHub.com. George Ramos, that's my name. 
Shari data that I was showing 12 is the GitHub repository that we're sort of building out for the data that will allow me to help with anything. And then, uh, and lastly, it was the community organization project I was working on. So here, you can get stuff that will more or less let you load serious crime data into a post just database and assign the crimes to community areas and neighborhoods. So um, it's as clear as I could make it without kind of totally going off track, and I'd be happy to correspond with anyone who thinks this is interesting and wants to try and use it. Um, and as Dave was saying, we, uh, we do have a show your work motto, and um, we would not, we would be happy if we could sort of take what we have that was built on this and maybe make that available instead, uh, including something that helps with the, the updating and synchronization process. Um, but especially because synchronization is not totally reliable right now. We just have to really want to invest the time that. But this is here, ready for you to use, and I, I would gladly correspond. Um, so my email is just visitgmail.com. Uh, so if you decide that this is interesting, but you can't figure out how to get it going. If you have any familiarity with PostGIS, uh, I thought this is almost all just regular SQL and PostGIS. It might be a little bit um, So just wanted to let you all know that that is available, and I encourage you to use it. Back to questions. Okay, yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll give you some example that specific we are doing. Okay. We have 17 commissioners in the, in the county, and we need to please them. So that we want to say they support our funding, right? And they vote every year for our budget. So we do the map for their patient from their area. We call the patient origin study. So every year since 2004, we call this is your commissioner, you know, the 17 uh, district. This is uh, district one. So they let them see, because support us, you have a lot of, you know, residents come to us, so we got funding for that one. So we don't do this one like a public, but those things is a PDF we put on SharePoint. I don't even do that. And it's in the PDF format, and they can, you can download it, and they can print it out, and they can walk around, and somebody say that they like to have those kind of map, walk around. We do that every year, annually. So from that 24 to here, to our 2004 to here, so many years they can compare us if they increase or decrease or whatever. They can see these things, yeah. So I don't know, you know, this is uh, interesting to you guys or not because people think that this is like a static, not dynamic, yeah. Well, one of the other, uh, and this is maybe the way it like this, as I mentioned, the data is sort of changing all the time. Yes. So making permanent reports when the data changes, I mean, then again, all the PDFs that anyone ever makes are based on data that's liable to change later, and not, it's mm -hmm. not only our problem. Um, but we could potentially uh, sort of generate summary reports on a monthly and yearly basis and uh, either make the static pages that kind of address what you were describing, um, uh, that maybe, you know, we can come up with a different design than this, but sort of gave the community area by year summary. Um, it's not, it's an interesting thought. I mean, we can also regenerate those periodically, the whole history of them. Um, maybe that's not where they're going to do since we can then expect the is not in the future. But it's, so it's an interesting thought. Man, uh, let's uh, maybe so just uh, have like one or two more so we can take a little bit of a break and give these guys a rest. Great. Uh, so you, you mentioned civically minded nerds. Uh, one of the things that brings us all together is this uh, desire to work with uh, city data and data on topics like this. Um, you guys spend a lot of time working with city data and it'd be great if you could share with us maybe two or three important insights as we each of us engage data sets like the crime data itself or other data sets on the data portal. We should keep in mind, um, you know, main pearls will we'll inevitably run into and, and still look out for. Well, um, the biggest thing that I'm finding with this data is that um, Socrata, which is used for its data portal, is a nice tool. and I. Um, despite a little initial skepticism, I found that it's it's good for a lot of things. Uh, especially with a data set of this size, the fact that you can filter it down substantially before you try and download something is great. Um, of course, we want you to still have a thing, but that's still a good value thing. But um, the nature of these records as volatile, evolving things, as opposed to sort of statistical reports that summarize numbers, points, I think, to a shortcoming in applying Socrata to this use. Every role in this data set has what's supposed to be a unique ID that tells you here's a here's an event separate from these case numbers, because in fact case numbers are not unique and for homicides of the same uh, case number will appear once for each victim, whereas otherwise they tend to be unique. So it's a different column that's meant to be unique, although it's also not always unique, just by the sort of vagaries of how the use the data update. 
one of the things that we found is that for some of those, they were just double. And so we're trying to treat this as a database and say, okay, select where this is the ID, update the record, and that he's back. And having doubles. So that, that was weird. Mostly what's happened with those is that um, some of them have locations and the others don't. They otherwise are the same except for the location data. And so our loader um, mostly skips to one's dot location. So that mostly shakes out and or gets fixed in a day or two. Um, but so that's a weird thing. But um, there's a column in there that says last updated. So this is kind of the core of our issues with our data synchronization process. We just assumed that that was reliable or maybe methodical. Uh, but it's not. It's just what the city says is the last updated date for this record. Wherever this came from, these records come from different sources. Homicides have an uh, obviously different sort of ID numbering system than other crimes because they come from different sources, um, like five digits versus six digit IDs and stuff like that. Um, and so what we do every day is say, query the Socrata API uh, and ask it to only give the records whose last updated date is later than the highest last updated date that we have. But we don't get all the crimes when we do that. And the audit shows that that misses dozens, hundreds of crimes that somehow get in the system but don't match that pattern. So it just doesn't really work the way that people are used to sort of dealing with databases think that it should, and it would be possible for the city to use Socrata in a slightly different way and maybe get a little closer, where instead of asking for the column of the data set, we ask for a metadata column that said this record is an update. That's not how they use it. They basically wipe it out and replace it at night, so we can't do that. So um, we still have a problem. So now we have a thing where we can at least find every night IDs that are in the data set that we didn't <coughs> look because they didn't match that update query as well as IDs that are in our data set that are no longer in the official data set because they got deleted, <coughs> because there are crimes that disappear. And as far as I can tell, there's nothing nefarious to that. It's just a peculiarity, but um, I spot checked some, and in cases where they disappeared, I could find another crime with the same case number, but a different ID, that presumably they just sort of had a record keeping edge, and so some drop out. So at any given time, we may have a few dozen crimes here that never happened because they dropped out of the data set. The audit process, just trying to keep that up, we had one problem one day, the audit process deleted like two million crimes that it thought were excess. And I think that was because while we were looking, the download of the full data set just got truncated halfway through. So it said, oh well, it states only has two million rows, you've got five, two and a half million, you've got five million, let's get rid of the ones right there. So that was kind of a hassle to restore because the audit process was not designed to deal with the discrepancy of two million records. <laughs> So basically, the, the long and short is, especially for data that has kind of transactional uh, nature, Socrata isn't really being used by the city in a way that makes that work where you think it would. So the city's kind of promoting sort of commercial applications on top of stuff, let alone people want to be here for civic causes. Just be aware that it's not quite as tight as you might guess. I'll contribute two things to that question. One related to that. Uh, on a prior project, I went to Socrata and asked them, you know, why why don't I have a last updated date on a per row basis? Because I have unique identifiers on a per row basis. Socrata said, identifiers, not the Yes, yes. Socrata identifiers. Socrata has an internal identifier for every row in any of its data sets. Um, and their answer was, most cities who use Socrata blow away the data set at night and completely replace it. And so every night there's new unique IDs for the same rows. Because um, you guys, I mean, you guys have dealt with it. You can imagine yeah. what you have to do to generate a report and just like pump the whole thing. Don't leave. And then pump it in the new thing. Talks that's probably been themselves to be more precise about it. Right. So I would just say that, that's something really, really look out for with Socrata. And um, we thought the updated date field in the city's data set would be helpful. It turns out it's less reliable than we hope. But with data sets, they don't even have that. Um, and so you may be stuck if you're looking at changing data sets, doing some fairly fancy analysis techniques, including just downloading CSVs day after day and dipping them. Um, you get really nerdy about it, but, but there's, there's some real complexity there. The other thing that I would just add to what Joe said, and you can see it in his data dive repository as well. And something that I've learned in my six months now on the uh, Edge team is always make your trans transformations reproducible. Always scriptify them. Always make sure that if you've done a data transformation, um, you can do it again. Um, if you don't do that, you're sunk. And I 
uh, before the Tribune, I was working in government, um, and we didn't have that kind of uh, discipline. We were working with a really big data set surrounding network performance data, and we had really, really serious problems when we would apply transformations and then not really know what happened because nobody actually, somebody just did it in a, in a SQL shell or something like that. Um, and we had no way of either A, getting back because it was a huge data set, many terabytes, and, and nobody was backing it up, sadly. Um, and B, uh, because uh, those transformations were lost to history. So um, always, always, uh, uh, if you have a process like that, um, put it in version control, make sure you hang on to it, make sure you can replicate it over and over. Um. Uh, what I would say is uh, maybe we'll let these guys go right now uh, because we'd like to get uh, you know Jason up and give you guys a little bit of a break. Uh, but you know after Jason, you know we can you know run through the ringer with questions. Um, you know <laughs> we're hoping that everybody sticks around. You know you ought to meet each other and you know, these guys will be in the room. Uh, if they can hopefully stick around, so you can really uh, go get them as well. Uh, so yeah, stand up, shake it out, finish uh, the table, and um, yeah. see you in a couple of minutes. We decided to just uh, take what the city has for that. So oh, okay. that is how it's done. There's a couple things that we transform and clean up. Mostly in terms of just sort of minimizing the total of different departments. At first, I was like, is this a joke? <laughs> but, uh, well, that's how the city runs. <laughs> Yeah. Would you like to do some talk? We were talking about having a series of guys from Bank and Lunches. Would you be willing to do that? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, I really uh, uh, well, yeah, so, yeah, I think people are really yeah, like this kind of stuff is good for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
This should be coming out. They're telling me Everybody, if I can encourage you to start bookmarking your place in conversations, I probably encourage you to return to them. Uh, but to keep the, the evening going, I wanted to be able to introduce uh, just not the I gave him a couple of minutes to talk about the videos that I was working with. And also, you are looking, are you on the hunt for no. data analysts? Yes. Yeah, so you know, this guy in particular is somebody who should have uh, time to ask the presentation. Yeah, so you can hunt him down. Uh, so once, once we get it back up, uh, basically, go yeah. for it. Thank you. Um, this is a short presentation. I, I tend to talk long, so um, please ask questions. Um, this is a little bit different from what I think this group has seen before. Um, I'm not showcasing any cool visualization. Um, I'm talking about a source of data that I have, uh, that I have access to, and I'm seeking uh, assistance. Um, Oh. As I mentioned before, uh, I'm based out of, I'm actually based out of the Lansing area. Um, uh, my appointment, I had been associated with Michigan State University. Um, I left the university uh, to chase the data, the data that I'll talk about. I formed a nonprofit organization to continue the work that I'm doing. That organization is called Youth Outcomes. Um, I do primarily uh, firm evaluation, uh, strategic planning, and grant writing in the Flint area. Um, I don't know how many of you know about Flint. Um, they've been in the news quite a bit. There have been movies, there are documentaries about her me uh, by Mike Moore. Uh, Flint is an extremely high-need community. Um, 
Uh, their population currently is about 100,000. That's down from 200,000 back in 1960. Um, it's primarily African American, um, and poverty is huge. Um, and, and, and I have a simple chart that uh, presents that poverty. Uh, the biggest need in Flint, uh, the biggest risk factor, is violence. Um, they have been on the top five most violent cities for the last, I think, 2006, 2007. Um, you can see what that estimate is. I don't know how that compares to the Chicago area. Um, I'm assuming that violence is a problem in Chicago as well. Um, the African, uh, let's see. Um, the history of Flint, for those of you who don't know, it's it's birthplace of General Motors. Um, it is a manufacturing community that has no manufacturing jobs left. Um, GM pulled out uh, in here, but you can see that uh, the number of jobs at GM went from eight thousand to eight thousand. Um, and so this is an impoverished impoverished community um, that is full of violence. Uh, Mortality is uh, one of the highest in the state, I think it's number two. Um, it's a proud community. Um, they, uh, the sit-down strike in Flint was what led to the formation of the United Auto Free. Uh, so that, is, that infuses who the people are. Uh, nonetheless, there is a lot of need. Um, so as I mentioned before, my training, I'm a developmental uh, psychologist, I somehow through my, my training really is in uh, behavioral neuroscience. Um, through a series of accidents, I got roped into community uh, uh, involvement uh, within research that then uh, translated into uh, program evaluation. I work with, primarily within the school districts. Um, and in terms of addressing those needs of the community, uh, we really address youth programming uh, through after school programs and in school. Uh, health, safety, nutrition programs. Um, uh, I work, I don't know if how the school systems work in Illinois. Um, we have regional agencies that are basically, they cover all the school districts within the county. They're called the community school districts. I don't know if that's the same as you. They're, they're generally an added capacity building organization, grant writing, uh, uh, securing federal and state grants uh, to provide additional services in addition to the educational of the schools and districts. Um, I, I work both with Genesee Intermediate School District, which oversees all 21 districts within the county, um, and Flint City Schools, which is the largest district in the county. I work with them separately. Um, uh, for Genesee Intermediate School District, I do program evaluation of after school nutrition programs, of sex ed, of uh, prenatal programs, uh, just all sorts of things. Flint City Schools is primarily um, absolute. Uh, funding from uh, other partners, CS Mott, the two Mott foundations are huge within the community. They, they support a ton of youth programming, especially the CS Mott. They have a lot of initiatives in the absolute. And Ruth Mott does a lot of home-grown uh, projects from building capacity of youth, uh, through gardening, uh, bounce programs, arts and culture. Um, Michigan State University, as I mentioned, I had been there. Um, I'm still at no faculty in the department of psychology there. Um, the, uh, the purpose, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, addressing the, the community need um, has been through the school system. There are also economic development issues. Uh, I've not been a part of those. So what I will be talking about and what I am representing is are the school systems. Um, school systems that have uh, organically come together to build a data set on which they can both address their needs assessment as well as the outcomes. Um, funding, uh, I've right, different funding sources. Right now, the, the only funding comes from the evaluation components of the same programs that uh, Gen C Intermediate School District and Gen City School has with their uh, projects. Um, and so <clears throat> part of the conversation, um, Back in 2003, there was a large conversation uh, where community partners were brought, back, brought together to talk about, we are working together to address this problem. We have multiple sources of funding, and there are multiple sources of uh, multiple evaluation needs 
for these programs. Let's get together and talk about a unified way of evaluating uh, our work. Also providing um, a, a way of uh, understanding what our community needs so we can target services to particular schools and districts and communities the Flint, Genesee uh, County area. Um, my training uh, is, is um, within psychometrics and within that uh, uh, variable modeling. Um, so I have, I actually have a copy of the survey for those of you who are interested. I'm not sure how many of you are interested in this, um, but uh, <laughs> there are not enough for everyone. Um, I, I brought the number that had RSVP. I think are. Um, and so to address this need, um, what we did was uh, we knew we had access to school data set, uh, sets. We also have access to community. Um, but to uh, address the, these various psycho uh, behavioral uh, programs, um, things like character education, balance prevention programs, uh, we developed a survey. We modeled the survey after known um, larger national data sets uh, or surveys. Um, uh, my postdoctoral training was at Tufts University. I was with Richard Learner, some of you may have heard him. Um, uh, on a, uh, a, a 4-H, a national 4-H evaluation. Um, and so some of this, uh, that model, some of that survey work is in this survey. Um, uh, the YRBSS, the CDC's measure of uh, youth risk, um, which is uh, some scale from that survey. Um, the Search Institute's uh, 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 internal and external assets survey. Um, so a variety of different uh, surveys. Um, multiple indicator, meaning, uh, I don't know if this is in, uh, but uh, we have multiple questions on the same contract. And so instead of asking, are you depressed, so like a depression, uh, a depression, we ask multiple uh, questions about that. So that, uh, in theory, we could model out uh, some sources of error um, and have a cleaner result of what depression is um, and the other uh, scales. On the right here, you can see these are, um, we have a broad range of domains. There's about 200 questions on this survey. The survey has gone through multiple iterations. Um, but you can see that we, we cover everything from uh, what goes on in school, um, from academic attitudes to ratings to teachers, what happens in the home uh, to what happens in the neighborhood. And we know all these different contexts are important for any one different intervention, whether it's a single uh, school-based intervention on nutrition, we know that what happens in the home and in the neighborhood is very important. So we try to measure all those sources of influence when, uh, in trying to understand the effectiveness of the interventions that are delivered. Um, modeled after uh, a particular um, model of positive development, is the five C's model. Um, may not mean a whole lot to some of you. Um, and community refined. What is meant by this is that this is not um, uh, a university project. This is a university partnership um, with the community, where community and the university came together to say, what are our needs, what's appropriate for our community um, in terms of question sets. And so uh, these uh, uh, scales that sometimes we, that we pulled from different data sources, we <coughs> had to uh, modify those to meet the community. So we violated uh, intentionally, uh, unfortunately, uh, some of the reliability and validity of those. Um, so how was your reliability and validity after you modified? Did you measure that one before you? Yeah. And, so how was that? In terms of the survey development, I mean, okay, so how was that? cutoffs in terms of reliability estimates are above me, uh, seven. Um, and and then, how about the validity? What type of validity you have been done? Well, generally construct validity. Just so construct. I ran, um, Factor analysis, confirming for factor analysis uh, to establish that we're not measure, measuring seven. Yeah, because when you do these kind of questionnaire, it's most important is you are major what you intend to major. You know, that's what we PhD for, right? right? You are major what you intend to major. You don't want to major in orange and apple or different things, yeah. So I'm not familiar with these kind of school things, but I'm very familiar with the behavioral things, yeah, with uh, from my background and my PhD tracking too, yeah. 
So we very, very emphasize about the validity and reliability. And you first since you report any instrument that like this, you tell people about your validity and reliability and then let people say, okay, yes, you are major, what do you intend? You intend to major. Yes. Well, okay. yeah, we spend a um, uh, tremendous amount of time establishing those things. Um, and we, we, we cheated a little bit by drawing off of national uh, surveys that had known reliability and validity. And then whenever we made changes, we made sure that we didn't completely destroy the construct. Um, but again, you know, when, when you're working with the communities and, and they say, you can't ask that question, you have to honor that. Um, or in this survey, you'll notice that the drug use items, um, there's a whole new scaling on that, and that is, I don't know what this item is. We had to put that. We, uh, we worked with community mental health, and they said, we want to know what K2 is. This is that synthetic marijuana. Uh, what, what are the estimates in our community? But then other community partners uh, from the school said, well, you know, to what extent are we teaching our kids what a drug is and how will uh, uh, you follow from that? And so it becomes a large dialogue, and then the, the way we negotiated that out was to add I don't have it, so that you're not pushing it. Um, and yeah, I can spend time talking about how I think that actually uh, derives truer data in terms of estimates of non um, Is I want to, there aren't any questions about sex. There are no questions about sex. That was that was a uh, uh, that is a need. Uh, we ask for the sex ed programs. We, we have a separate survey that's anonymous. Um, but that was something uh, that we could not do with this. Um, let me talk a little bit about why that is. Um, this, this is uh, this is not just a longitudinal data set. It's not a, a cross It's cross It has both elements of this data is all identified. So we track individual kids, um, not only from fourth grade, we, we track kids once they receive a, a state ID number, uh, a school based state ID number, which can be uh, acquired as early as a pre-K program, um, we track those kids if they're involved within, if they receive a service. Um, and so, and once they, they graduate from those uh, pre-K programs into the K system, you know, the K-12 system, then uh, we can track them as well. Um, but we track, we know which kids are taking what surveys. Um, our unique identifier code that we need to everything is the state assigned identifier code. And then within specific analysis, we have uh, certain dummy uh, uh, variables that we use. Go ahead. Um, how did you get around, how did you deal with purple? Uh, well, a couple different things. We have an active parental consent What's policy. What's um, oh, for purpose, the, I am not sure. Federal Education. Yeah. 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 Basically, basically there, there's a law that's a lot like uh, COVID, the Children's Health and Privacy Protection Act. Sorry. Um, it basically says that you, you can't have, kids cannot have a uniquely identifying number or you know, some kind of identification that we need people to you know what time who they are. So let me address that. I, I have access to the state because I'm an outside auditor as the local auditor. Um, so there are exemptions for that. Okay. Now when I say that everything is linked in, I work with the IT departments of both the ISD and uh, like community schools, <coughs> to uh, link the data sources from year to year of the survey um, uh, to those identifiers. And then once that's linked, uh, we set that aside and actually a safety box. Uh, um, so, uh, and then we employ uh, uh, active parental consent. Um, and that's actually changing. That, that is sort of a, a, a target. So, uh, no. Uh, this is me actually saying, well, that's awesome that you're finding a way through. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, part, part of, um, yeah, the, the, the IRB consent issues are, I mean, that would, that would be a whole data pop up conversation. <laughs> um, but yes? Uh, what are your response rates like? Uh, response rates are, are range from 2% um, uh, of the school population to 98%. And that is heavily dependent upon 
uh, to the principles in that school, and how much they, uh, they buy into this process, the relationships between the ISD, uh, and the intermediate school district, and that um, And so we, we have all sorts of threats to the validity of the data in terms of uh, representation, generalization, However, the longitudinal nature uh, of the data allows us to hedge some of that. Do you um, still get bulk rate of return? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, not a lot. But, you know. um, so let me talk a little bit about what we, we what this survey uh, is. We we survey fourth graders through twelfth graders every year. Um, each year we consent to the parents, but the consent is written as entry into a longitudinal study. So. Once they enter into the longitudinal study, they have the opportunity to uh, opt out. But we will survey them even if, in you know, subsequent years, they don't uh, return a uh, um, uh, Fourth graders are much more compliant than 12th graders, both in terms of showing up to the survey and also in terms of completing the survey. As you can see, this is a long survey. Um, in my experience, the best compliance is with the youngest kids. Um, compliance is with the oldest kids and especially teachers. Don't take this very literally, but um, I'm sorry about the, the sorry about it. Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> let's see what else. Uh, we've been doing this since 2005. I the the IRB process the Michigan State University our first year they allowed us um, a past consent policy. Next year they, they required an active consent policy. So I was able to um, actually went back into that data and ran some analyses looking at parents who received who sent in a yes uh, under active, parents who sent in a no under active, and parents who did not receive uh, return in huge differences, huge differences in uh, who these kids are and, uh, in terms of uh, response rates, uh, in terms of depression, anxiety, academic performance across the board. Um, so that's, that's, that's a huge major issue. Um, oftentimes, in the analyses that I'll run, I'll look at those kids who have completed multiple years of uh, data only, um, which are a sub-select uh, group of kids, um, but uh, has a truer sense in terms of change. Uh, any other questions about sort of the design of this? It's countywide. Um, well, let me talk about that a little bit. We, we survey uh, over 100 schools uh, in the county. Um, it's not every school. Uh, we survey more elementary schools than middle schools and high schools you know, in terms of availability, but also um, uh, access. Uh, which schools we're in changes from year to year depending on if that school closes in the Flint County. Every year we have schools close. We had uh, four schools in Flint City District close this past year. So, Nightmare in terms of tracking kids. Being that it's countywide and we track kids by UIC or this state ID number, uh, I can track kids as they move from district to district um, in the county. They move outside of the county, they're lost. Um, uh, but most mobility is within the county. Now, with that said, since I've started working with this, I've seen the enrollment for the entire county go from 90,000 to 70,000. So there's a lot of um, have you looked at IRS records to see what the net migration of those I look up, I'm sorry, IRS records or anything like that? Like IRS keeps track of it because they can look through the files you have here and figure out bugs in and out of counts. I've not. I've not. Um, the, the, one, of, one of the things that you'll understand about this is that there is a mountain of data um, uh, that I only scratch the surface of. Um, Do we? Do yeah. the schools also administer the YRBS? Yeah, so there's actually the, the YRBS, some of the schools administer that. There's also a state survey called the MyFi, which is Michigan Health. Um, the reason that we do this, in addition to that, is because we have access to the raw data that allows us to run this bunch of statistics to, in service of um, uh, understanding where the needs are and the plan. Do some of the schools off, though? If in the survey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, the, it's it's all about relationships. Um, and so, you know, right now there's uh, the, the unit that I work with is health, safety, and nutrition in uh, intermediate school district. Uh, there has been a, a, a change in leadership. The, the previous director of 
parish was nominally respected across the county and state. Uh, the new director is, is she's new, so uh, those relationships are variable um, and you can build it. So that does have an effect on the quality of the data that we collect. So this is, uh, this is a fantastic data set and uh, an amazing amount of work to do. I'm curious um, how we might be able to help, knowing that there are these permissions issues and I'm not sure what it would take to get someone who's interested in helping you approval to work with the data, but um, what what can this group or individuals in this group potentially do with this data? Yeah, let me let me address that really quickly, but let me just talk about what other data sources I got. Um, very quickly, I have access to basically any data that starts to collect. Um, grades, state standardized uh, uh, test scores, enrollments, free and reduced lunch rates, um, disciplinary referrals, disability tests, and last home address. Um, this is all highly sensitive data, um, and there is a lot of concern uh, about the sharing of this data. And so if someone were to come up to say, hey, you know, why don't you send me your data set on uh, yeah. drug use? I, I can't do that. Um, and so because of uh, uh, parents, you know, the consent form that we have does not uh, specify that. I think that there are many ways to get around that in terms of um, uh, I can release the identified data um, or random samples of the identified data. Um, but those are all different factors that would have to be figured out. Um, I, are you allowed to produce aggregate statistics? I'm sorry? You are allowed, uh, but can you publicize aggregate statistics of schools and districts? I'm not sure. Let me answer that, and then you can tell me if I did not answer. Um, I, part of the reason that this data set exists is because the schools are highly sensitive about releasing their, their data to, in fact, newspapers uh, is one of them, um, particularly Flint City Schools. Um, and so they wanted a data source, a secure data source that they could access and have um, full access to uh, and analysis. And so they have funded this. They have funded this completely, um, almost completely. Uh, and so, uh, uh, releasing the data um, uh, has been a challenge in terms of a lot of organizations, not just the schools, but community organizations, community mental health, uh, uh, other nonprofits, um, Boys and Girls Club, for example, wanted access to this data. Um, however, how, how to disaggregate or how to de identify the actual school district? while maintaining some sort of neighborhood, like, uh, 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 I don't know you, what the term would be, visualization, you know, so that they can act upon it, um, that is a, a major challenge. Obviously, the home address is, is one way to skirt around that, um, but we, you know, we, we are still in the process of trying to figure out uh, what that process is like. So to answer your question, um, what we need, um, I do a lot of just basic inferential statistics and anything from a t-test to cost tabs to more advanced things. I don't have the skills to present things other than bar charts and mind and mind charts and stuff like that. We have a, a lot of different data that can be presented in equal ways um, based on at least my understanding. Um, developing a proposal, whether that is a single page kind of thing uh, that I can pitch to my, my partners in the schools, um, in terms of that would say two things. One is, here's what the scholarly uh, uh, output would be, <coughs> how it benefits society as a whole or something. But here are the products that we can provide back to you, in terms of, you will have a, you know, whatever it is, a GIS map, or some analyses, or whether it's um, an application to a, uh, a, a for a research grant that could support some of the programmatic activities or data collection. These are all things uh, that are fundamentally important to the schools in terms of the sustainability of the project. Um, uh, so, uh, in terms of magnitude of the data, we've been doing this for eight years. We're in our ninth year. Um, Again, this is a longitudinal, so we've tracked these kids. Uh, we've administered over 90,000 surveys. Um, we have over 40,000 unique students in the data. 
data set. Um, because of the filtering in and out of, of kids and uh, other various sources of mobility, we have three or more years of data, linked data, um, on uh, over 6,000 students. Um, that's all, uh, that doesn't include, I have the, the district information grades in each course and those sorts of things on every student. Um, so why am I here? Basics, uh, schools need um, actionable data and analyses, things that they can make decisions upon. Um, uh, other community agencies need this data as well to make informed decisions. Um, and the data system itself uh, has a need to be sustainable. It's not sustainable as it currently is. Um, Lots of different things, and you guys, I don't know, I mean, there's lots of different uh, uh, cool things that can be done with the data. These are some that, that I just came out of, I just jotted down. Uh, I'm sure you have much more, uh, much better ideas. So, so questions? Yeah. I mean, you said the data system is not sustainable. Well, I, data system in terms of the collection uh, management well, so uh, There's no external funding at this point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, just to review the last few slides, it sounds like there are two, maybe I'm, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, two potential big areas of uh, collaboration. One is um, applications of the data that are school facing uh, that help the decision makers make their dashboards based on this data that, that provide the insights that um, And then the other is um, research questions that, um, that you can get research funding. Yeah, you can actually affect your tool. Yeah, I can say that the reporting that I do back, uh, we've, we've toyed around with some web-based systems. The first one that we contracted out was hard-coded, that the next year's data would work. Um, that was in-house within uh, the unit I was in at Michigan State. That was a, a learning uh, experience. Another one was a freeware program that it, like, it did not look nice. Um, and then last year, I created uh, reports for every school in itself. So a lot of happening. Yeah. So um, I uh, work doing with some of the work I do with um, the ideas from that. Um, one of the things that I'm um, geeking out about and at the same time empathizing with you about <laughs> is that you were able to find a way to legitimately collect all this data, but you have an almost impossible task of actually acting on it yeah. because of what to do. So one of the things I was I thinking about is, from a data perspective side of the work that we're doing, we're, 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 we're more than deeper than the notion of federated identity. The, notion, the idea being that you as a student, you as an adult, whatever, you have you have access to, complete access to all of your electronic data, all of your, your activity, whatever. But you, there are protections with that, that come with that, that, that identity, rights and that privileges to certain aspects of that information, that, that unique identifier, that they can get the aggregate data that you can contribute about any one of these things. You have control over who has access to sharing it, so you are always a driver, but that they don't necessarily have access to who you are. So, you could, so the idea that you could share the data about you, <coughs> like you know, you know, Johnny or Jane, who's you right. know, oh, yeah. Yeah, 312, right. right? They can share all this data about you know this you know legacy data that they collected about them without knowing who they are necessarily, but could be used that you know that person X is the same person in all this data, and so you do want to do the you know, or kind of diagonal analysis if you need to. That, none of that exists yet, right? But well, well, I, they, so, but my, thought, yeah. my thought is, as you are coming up with the agreements to look to do these surveys, 
one of the things that you may want to consider in the design is not just the design of the survey itself, but also the design of the rights and the permissions that are associated with this, so that there are kind of like a, I guess, a handwritten federation agreement that, like, there are things in this, there are some sections of this survey that we're going to share in certain ways, you know, and we're going to make expressly say that that's okay. We're not going to share this information that's personally identifiable, but we are going to make sure that this information is you know, launched to so we understand that it's for you. So that's informed consent. That's what we have to, because I deal with a patient, we are mandatory to upload data to CDC, upload data to American Public Hospital Association. We sterilize the data. So, if, for example, medical record number, right? That's a identifier. We don't reveal that one. We use a last four digits of a social security number, the date of birth, and then come back with the last name, first name, initial. So, we create a new identifier, and we send it out to CDC, send out to American public. Yeah, we do the same thing. You do the same yeah. things, right? Yeah. The project had been uh, IRB approved by Michigan State University for okay. mm -hmm. six of the eight years. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm trying to do is divest the actual collection of data back onto the schools so mm -hmm. that they collect the data themselves, and that liability is. <laughs> yeah, if you see the Chicago, uh, Chicago Public Hospital, they have a SharePoint photo over there. And they have, uh, you know, each school, they, the parents can go look and look at how this school's performance. So they can determine where I want to send my kids go. You know, those kind of charter school, those kind of things, yeah. So if that we website... Also child assignments, which mm -hmm. from sharing that data. Oh, you do? Okay, that's nice, yeah, because that's one of good way. And also, since you have 6,000 over three years of repeat major, so you can do repeat major analysis. That's very mm -hmm. useful. That's more advanced, uh, you know, analysis, not a lot of t-test. It is very low-end, basic analysis things. Yeah, so much more advanced. Yeah, my 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 frustration is in how to communicate what a repeated measured analysis is or latent variable modeling to. From some statistician, you know, they they are you know, there's a PhD over there, and number, you know, that's very famous for public health. And they have good PhD over there, the statistician. They can help you. Um, so I don't know if this would be useful or but maybe just really quickly have a go of hands if you're interested in working with this data in some capacity. And I, I don't know if that's some way to, if that's the right way to go about signaling, but... Well, I think my contact fun. information, I mean, that would be useful, but my contact information is also in the... Yeah, so that would, yeah, that's good enough for one off, but I'm curious, uh, I'm well well together, but it's useful to be able to look across and be like, oh, you're also interested in kind of working with this, maybe we can IDA it a little bit and then we we wait for just each person individually to contact you. <laughs> you don't know us. We use all that together. Sure. Okay. I don't know. Is that helpful? So like, want, I find this data really fascinating. Well, we'll see if we can check out. Uh, well, so we'll also post your, uh, I actually, I, I can see the uh, feature, uh, the, the contact slide. Uh, but we'll also uh, post your contact information on the meetup page. Yep. Uh, and you know, maybe uh, you give folks access, access to your presentation. Yeah, so that anybody who would have missed the follow up or like questions. Yeah, and then, I mean, even if you're not interested in data, there have been a lot of life lessons, professional lessons that have been acquired in the process of collecting these data that I would be happy to share. Uh, so, actually, uh, one more follow up question. Uh, you know, what is your funding position? In terms of you know, like the ability to take on, you know, so I mean, one one thing that is you know, generally in the room is the process of you know, pro bono interaction with people to share tools or statistical methods, you know, or ideas with you. Uh, you know, do you have the ability to work with or? Oh yeah, uh, so yeah, yeah. I and more or less, it, the nonprofit is, is modeled after a consulting. So we do have the ability to expand. We also do have some limited funds to support. Uh, uh, non scholarly direct, you know, uh, application data you know, product development. Okay, so, um, you know, and my, my interest is not really within my personal, but in, in developing a sustainable system that, that, that the community can hold themselves and I can walk away from the So, that's okay. Okay, well, uh, let's uh, thank Jason. Um, <laughs> 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 previous break, did you actually do a good job about finishing up the table? Uh, 
if uh, you uh, didn't bring food along, uh, we ask uh, you know, kindly if you would contribute to the pot with a little paper bag uh, with a few dollars. Uh, we ask for five, you know, whatever you think uh, is just about right. Um, other than that, um, you know, please do stick around. Um, you know, like, oh, you know, make the connections in terms of, you know, who was here. Uh, I don't think that there's any, you know, close limitation to the space. Uh, so, yeah, go around, shake somebody's hands. Thank you. Oh, God. 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 Oh,